It's time for Security Now, the show that covers your security online. Steve, this week, takes a look at the certificate authority system. It's broken badly. He's got some proposals for saving SSL. Stay tuned. Security Now is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 319, recorded September 21st, 2011. CA Trust. Security Now is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Security Now, the show that protects you online. I guess those all, all those sharks and meanies out there who were trying to get your credit card numbers, get your information. Steve Gibson is here. He is the host of our show and our anti-shark uh, defender, I guess. <laughs> That that works. Yeah. Uh, I'd be happy to be the anti shark defender. Shark during repellent. Twits shark week. That's yes. It's Shark Week on Twit. By the way, <laughs> we have a little uh, a little toy shark shark that floats around the uh, studios this week. Mm. I figured it only lasts a week because it's inflatable, so we probably won't have it. We probably won't be around much longer. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. There, there used to be like networked screensavers, didn't there? Where something would wander around the screens. Oh, what a good idea! Within. A, Within a network, and so it was like, you know, where's Waldo or or whatever this thing was, you know, like like a, you know, like a turn all the screens into a a single looping fishbowl, and so the fish like you know swims onto your screen and swims off of yours onto someone else's. Let's do that. I gotta find those. I don't know if those yep. are around anymore. Nobody uses screensavers anymore. Yeah, true. Used to be that was fun. True. You don't need them anymore. So Steve, today we're going to talk about really kind of the. Um, the offshoot of Komodo hackers' attack on uh, DigiNotar. Right. Um, we're, th there have been, for, for years, it's been understood that the existing model that we have for, for SSL TLS trust that is based on certificate, <clears throat> excuse me, certificate authorities, which we unequivocally trust to always do the right thing, that that model is getting a little creaky and having problems. And of course, in the last couple of weeks, we've, as you said, we've really seen this with DigiNotar, which, by the way, has declared bankruptcy, which is a What? Fabulous, I didn't hear that. Holy fabulous, cow. Fabulous. Yep. Fabulous outcome. Uh, I'm hoping that all, because, you know, they basically they had really lame security. We, we saw if we're to trust what was posted by the Komodo hacker guy, a you know ridiculously insecure password protecting their stuff and and they were vulnerable to SQL injection attacks which just can't be allowed to happen so I'm hoping that other security um, authorities will look at that and say to their IT people okay I don't care what it costs we can't have this happen to us so you know we may have to lose a few along the way to get the rest to pay attention, but hey, that's a price I'm willing to pay. So. I, I hate it though that, that that this kid or whoever this Komodo hacker is is sitting there gleefully saying, "I brought him down, I brought him down." It just makes me. It's it's almost yeah. like he's 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 won. I don't mind. I I don't feel the same way. I feel like if a kid can do this, then other people can have <laughs> True. also. True. Maybe other people were doing it more quietly. The yeah. problem is of this happening and and us not finding out about it because this guy generated 500 plus certs. He, you know, he wasn't very stealthful. What we really don't want is this to be done without our knowledge. Right. So, so this is. That, well, there are, there are several things wrong with this whole model. That's our topic for today is how was it broken and what can we replace it with? Moxie Marlin Spike, our old friend, has come up with something um, that, that 
he suggests, which is actually based on some research and prototypes where were, that were put together by some researchers at Carnegie Mellon, um, and that's really going to be the model for what we talk about as a, a whole different approach toward establishing trust on the Internet. Before we get into all of that, you appeared on Channel 7 in Los Angeles last night. I did. Make it with uh, consumer reporter Rick Romero making a case for better passwords. Well, yeah, they picked up on a mention in Time magazine a couple of weeks before about the passwords haystack page and the concept, and they, they got it. They understood what it was about, and they said, wow, isn't this important? I said, I think so. <laughs> so <laughs> Might they, be. So they said, let's Could tell be. everybody. Well, let's watch Steve Gibson on uh, ABC7 uh, in uh, Los Angeles. How safe are your computer passwords? Well, I'm going to show you two passwords, and you try to figure out which one is harder for a hacker to crack. Now, this first one is going to be a series of symbols, and we're going to also put in a few letters and a couple of numbers. All right? Now, here's the second one. This one, we're going to use the letter D, a zero, a G, and then just a bunch of dots after the G. Well, believe it or not, this one right here is harder, and here's why. Making the password longer slows down their ability to figure out what the password is, and length matters more than complexity. Stephen Gibson is a computer hacking expert. Because every password is like a needle in a haystack, he came up with something he calls a haystack calculator. It's a website that can show you immediately how easy or how hard it is to crack your password. Unfortunately, people like to use simple passwords so they can remember them. And 123456 is the most common password. And the word password is also near the top of the list. Oh, boy. And so is this phrase. I love you. In fact, they are so common, hackers actually put them into a dictionary of passwords. So Gibson says you need to make the haystack as big as possible to really hide the needle. And Gibson's calculator shows how longer passwords make the haystack bigger. Here he demonstrates by adding one character at a time. We can see that the length of time required is increasing very quickly to the point where now we're at in the worst case, 38 centuries before the password is hacked. In other words, you don't have to make the password so complicated you can't remember it. Just add more characters. And it doesn't matter what they are. They could just be colons or, you know, come up with something that is like your own personal secret and you add that to your password and it makes it vastly stronger. But the safest passwords will have at least one letter in uppercase and another one in lowercase. There will be at least one digit and one symbol. Twelve characters long is optimum. That's great. Isn't that good? I can't believe that ran on a mainstream nightly news telecast. Yeah, I know. And I showed it to my baristas at Starbucks this morning, and they're like, wow, I'm going to change my passwords. <laughs> that's, you know, th you know, that's really good. I thought they had to be absolutely impossible to remember. I said, not so much. You know, you want it not to be in a dictionary, but as soon as it's not in a dictionary, then length trumps complexity from there. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was, you know, at 5.40 p.m. in L.A. on, I guess they have the biggest market share down here, too. So a lot of people watch KABC. You did good. Yeah. You did good, Steve. Cool. That's excellent. Came out, came out nicely. Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you what. Why don't we launch into uh, our uh, news and our hack updates and all that stuff, and uh, I will get the commercial uh, after uh, we do those before we talk about our conversation of the day, which is the future of certificate authorities. Okay, well, um, the, we have very little, happily, little security Yay, news. Yeah, I love it when that the, happens. <laughs> yes, uh, especially since we have plenty to talk about, uh, non-newsy stuff. Um, I did note uh, that DigiNotar has declared bankruptcy. Um, Wired.com's threat level page covered the story, as did a number of other venues, and they said a Dutch certificate authority that suffered a major hack attack this summer has been unable to recover from the blow and filed for bankruptcy this week. DigiNotar, which is owned by Illinois-based Vasco Data Security and was the primary provider 
of digital security certificates for domains owned by the Dutch government has br was breached in early June due to lax security. So RIP DigiNotar. And, and I will say again, this is a fantastic outcome. It's like, yes, it's, I'm, it's not convenient for all the people who purchase DigiNotar certificates. I don't know if there's any recourse for them except to write off the balance of, of amortized time and, and cost that they had on their certs before they expired and go buy replacements from someone else. But there's no way that a certificate authority can survive if none of the browsers are willing to trust them. And that's exactly what happened. As we've been covering over the last three weeks, all the browsers yanked their trust for DigiNotar in order to defend the security of the browser users. And that immediately puts the authority out of business. It's, it's RIP time. So, I mean, this is, this is a great outcome because all other certificate authorities looking at this have to recognize, I mean, th th there, there is, you know, these are companies, there are hierarchies of management. Nobody ever has enough time. IT never has enough money. And so in a boardroom, they're deciding who gets how much money and the amount of money that, that the IT get for security is a function of, of the perceived need for it. So, so this kind of event filters down through corporate hierarchies and, you know, changes the priorities in a way that benefits us, the people who are trusting the certificate authorities that our browsers are trusting, never to make this kind of mistake. So, you know, as we know, security is not black and white. We need this kind of, you know, we need the security of the, the, of the remaining surviving certificate authorities to be maintained and kept as high as possible. So this is, this was, this was I, I celebrate this. This is a great outcome. I'm glad that, that it happened as, as cleanly and as quickly as this. And really, there was no other outcome. If browsers are not going to trust you, it gets over. Right. I mean, your, your entire business is issuing certs that are trusted. And if you can't do that, you're, you're gone. Yeah. I just read another manifesto, another paste bin manifesto from Komodo Hacker saying, yeah. I'm the king of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say he earned it. So. <laughs> okay, there yeah. you go. I really, you know, it's like if they're, if they're going to have something yeah, as lame as easy? an SQL yeah. injection attack on their browser, boy, and, and, and then policies where, remember, they knew about this for weeks, yes. many weeks. No kidding. And they kept it quiet. And it's their behavior as much as mm -hmm. the, the, the breachiness of their network that is, is responsible for their downfall. Mozilla was livid that they were not notified. Yeah. You know, they, they saw indications that, that DigiNotar clearly recognized that they had had a breach and they'd said nothing. So it's like, okay, it's one thing to have a breach. It's another thing to misbehave afterwards. You, I mean, so it's not only that their, their security was untrustworthy, but they themselves, their own response to that. Because, I mean, I would cut them slack. I would say this could happen to anybody, unfortunately. We don't want it to happen to anybody, but it can. The question then is, how do you respond? And, right. you know, they did not respond properly. So... Um, okay, speaking of not responding properly, <laughs> the, the quote news unquote outlet that I love to hate, the register.co.uk, ran the headline, Hackers Break SSL Encryption Used by Millions of Sites. Hmm. This was endlessly tweeted to me over the last week, and so it, it does... So something has happened, and it's interesting and significant, and it is the topic for episode 321. But everybody, don't unplug your browsers. The end of the world is not nigh. We're, we're going to be fine. Um, they said, that is the register.co.uk said, quote, Research, researchers have discovered a serious weakness in virtually all websites protected by the secure sockets layer protocol that allows attackers to silently decrypt data 
that's passing between a web server and an end user browser. And that's not true. Um, later this week, some researchers in, I think, Brazil, at, at, at a conference in Brazil, are going to demonstrate something that they call BEAST, which is a cool acronym for Browser Exploit Against SSL TLS. Um, Beach is described as a cryptographic Trojan horse. And quoting from one of the articles that I had seen written up, they said, an attacker slips a bit of JavaScript into your browser, and the JavaScript collaborates with a network sniffer to undermine your HTTPS connection, says Trevor Perrin, an independent security researcher. If the attack works as quickly and widely as the researchers claim, it's a legitimate threat. Okay, so I, I, I will just so people understand what's going on a little bit before we cover this in really some fun detail, because this is an interesting hack. This is nothing new that was discovered. A vulnerability was understood about six years ago in our SSL protocol. The nature of the, pro the problem is that we've talked about encryption modes, modes of encryption, where we take a symmetric cipher and instead of encrypting each 128-bit block, for example, in the case of AES's Rheindahl, which is 128 bit at a time, symmetric cipher instead of encrypting each 128 bits and then the next 120 bits and the next 120 bits all independently there is some weakness there because that would mean that any time the same 128 bits was encountered as plain text it would encrypt into the same 128 bits of cipher text if it was under the same key so that's not a good thing so they take the, they, they take some residual from the prior blocks encryption and mix it in with the next blocks encryption to create a chain. And we talked about this, in fact, um, when we were talking about the, my off-the-grid cipher. I wanted to create the same kind of dependence between individual in, encryptions of individual domain name characters and that's where you have this notion of sort of mo walking around this latin square where your position gives creates memory in the system well similarly the prior encryption block creates memory that feeds into the next encryption block well the way all encryption up to version 1.1 1 .1 of tls operated was that the residual from the last block of the prior packet was used to initialize the first block of the next packet. But, be, but that's the nature of the vulnerability because you're, there's a little residual crossing between individual packets that allows bad guys to get in there. And again, this has been known as a problem for six years and it was fixed in version 1.1 of TLS, and it's been it's continued into version 1.2 of TLS. Anyway, it's it's an interesting hack. We're going to talk about it in two weeks, but it isn't the end of the world. Hackers didn't discover anything, but some and it's not even clear how exploitable it is because apparently you have to get JavaScript into your browser first. Well, the JavaScript, if it, unless they've come up with a way of breaking the same the same origin policy which no one has come up with a way of doing yet uh, so presumably they haven't then the javascript has to somehow come the the malicious javascript to, in order to execute from the site you're visiting but if you have ssl up then or or even on an ssl page then it's not clear how you get the bad javascript in in the first place in order to somehow collaborate with the sniffer anyway there's there's a lot we don't know it looks like it's sort of a it, it was a theoretical problem six years ago that is somewhat less theoretical today but 
far from hackers have broken SSL for millions of websites that that use it. So I wanted to to let everybody know we'll, we'll we're we're going to go into it in detail in two weeks. For in the meantime, don't worry about it because it looks like it really can't get anybody. All right. And uh, and finally, just a little miscellaneous comment: the uh, the the boards for my portable sound blaster. Uh, have been bouncing in and out of stock. They get 50 at a time. They sold out again last uh, after last week. They're back in stock and currently have 36 in stock. I imagine this is probably, we have to be winding down, but I'm just tickled that so many of our listeners have been curious about this. We don't have and, to And be. are buying these little puppies. We might sell all 35 before the end of the show. <laughs> we, we may well. So I wanted to let people know who may have been disappointed that it was sold out again, that it's back in stock at lpctools.com. And you know that you're at the right page because they added a little blurb in red saying, this is the one Steve Gibson was talking about on the podcast. I love it that they did that. And give a link to the podcast. That's fantastic. Yeah. 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 And uh, a, sort of an interesting note uh, from Lancy Mills about Spinrite. And uh, she said, Dear Steve, I recently purchased my first copy of Spinrite to help with an issue I've been having with my laptop. Now, this isn't a story about how Spinrite saved me in the last second of the last minute of the last day before the big collapse. <laughs> Neither like is this a story about how running Spinrite on level five recovered my data and found my neighbor's lost kitten in the process. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is something more sublime. Following other investigative procedures, I ran my new copy of Spinrite on level four and was able to determine that my physical memory dump blue screen errors, Windows XP folks, are not related to drive issues, but more likely due to excess heat. Hmm. Spinrite told me about that. But finally, long story short, and I think Lancy's probably wrong about this. I think it probably was a hard drive problem, as we'll see in a second. But she says, Finally, long story short, I ran my Windows defrag utility on my five-year-old laptop after using Spinrite and was then confronted with something I had never seen before, a 100% perfectly defragmented main drive. I was intrigued when I first saw the red stripes of unmovable regions that I had grown so used to beginning to disappear rapidly in the defrag window, and then I froze when they disappeared altogether and didn't come back. I had to take a screenshot to prove this to myself after the utility was done. Apparently, I wasn't hallucinating. Spinrite has many uses, as I've heard on the Security Now podcast, but this is a great side effect of the medicine that is Spinrite. Thank you. I feel better now. Sincerely, Lancy Mills, New York, New York. I love the name Lancy Mills, too. Yeah. Love it. So thank you, Lancy, for sharing. Um, and it's probably the case that there was something subtly not happy on the drive that was keeping Windows from being willing to relocate those areas. And Spinrite cruised across them, even though it may have reported no nothing clearly done. The drive is happier now. So probably the blue screens are gone. And uh, certainly, we got a complete defrag, which I have seen before also. So that's very cool. Steve, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about CA Trust and whether it's worth trusting them or do we need a new system in uh, just a little bit. Before we do, though, it's time for me to talk a little bit about Netflix.com and a free 30-day trial. As you know, Netflix has kind of restructured the company. They've separated the DVD by mail company and the streaming company. You know what? We've been talking about this for six months. The best deal in entertainment, absolutely, $7.99 for unlimited streaming movies uh, on Netflix is incredible. And I tell you, you probably have this capability if you've got a up-to-date TV or a Blu-ray player, a PS3, Xbox 360, uh, Nintendo Wii. I use a Roku box, but the Google TV does. Everybody, Apple TV, everybody's got Netflix. And, you know, I've been watching uh, last night Breaking Bad. I'm catching up because, you know, season four just started. What a great show this is. All of the first three seasons are available as part of your subscription right now. So you can, in high def, 
So you can catch up on Breaking Bad, which is just a wild, wonderful ride. Uh, lots of TV shows. Arrested Development, we've been going back through those. Um, Ally McBeal, remember that? Wow. Parks and Rec, The Office, a Mad Men. It just goes on and on. And, of course, movies, lots of movies, some of the best movies ever. And all of this, take your pick, tens of thousands of movies, TV shows, kids' movies, kids' TV shows, too. They can watch on the iPad. There's nothing. I mean, talk about a way to keep the kids entertained. Start watch. Get your, get an, get your iPad, load up the Netflix, and then you can watch an unlimited number of kids' movies. They just they hold it in their lap. They love it. Wish we'd had this when my kids were little. Actually, Abby's right now going through like <laughs> entire seasons of TV shows. <laughs> it's so much fun. Try it right now. Seven dollars ninety nine cents a month. And if you haven't yet signed up for Netflix, do it free for the first thirty days at Netflix.com slash twit. I know most of you are already members. So so Columbo. Oh, what fun. Murder she wrote. So here's the deal. Tell a friend. Share it. Share what you've learned. Tell everybody about Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit. They will thank you for it. And Steve and I will thank you for it as well. All right, Steve, uh, let's get to work here. The I actually have two other little bits oh, of good. completely random miscell miscellany. Um, I thought you'd get a kick out of knowing that I, Monday, made the mistake of trying an eight-shot latte. <laughs> No good? Not. Steve, you got to build up slowly. You went from uh, five to six. You, none, you, yeah, went to five to six. I've been doing six for a while. And slowly. Thought, <laughs> I've been thinking, you know, zing, this doesn't really have much zing to it anymore. Well, boy, let me tell you. Yeah, you eight felt shots. it with eight, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. What is that? Is that like, that's, that's 1.6 grams of caffeine? Something like that. That's a significant yeah. amount of caffeine to just pump yeah. right at, Boom. Yeah. You know, you could inject those and you <laughs> probably... I, I enjoy my mornings on the patio and I just don't feel cold no matter what temperature it is out. So And you get a lot done. Yeah, I really So you do. back to the um, you back to the six? <laughs> I went back I, I dropped back to six and I'm I'm happy there. I'm gonna stay there for yeah, a while. Yeah. Um, the second thing is I have sworn off any more reading of David Weber until I'm on my stair climber. I had I slipped into book number two, which I finished already because um, I just cannot put it down. And I will tell people, and I know you, Leo, especially, anyone who is not nearly moved to tears or at least really choked up at the end of book two wow. isn't human. Wow. Oh, my God, oh, it's wow. good. So it basically, is. I'm getting this picture of Steve Gibson hopped up on eight shots of caffeine <laughs> on his treadmill, bawling his eyes out. <laughs> Not on my treadmill. That's been the mistake, is ah. that, or the stair climber, is that I, I broke down and di and started reading on the Kindle, which I, you know, ah. I can do almost, you know, 24 so hours a day. Now you're eating it like candy. I am Good. not going, I'm not, I'm not, first of all, I'm not touching it until I finish Freedom TM. I'm about two-thirds of the way through. I'm surprised um, you were able to put that down because that's a pretty, at the end especially, gets very gripping. Well, believe me, Leo, after, after, after 60 minutes with your heart rate at about 155 <laughs> um, and saturating a paper towel that you've got rubber banded to your forehead. Not a matter of putting it down. It's, I, I have, I'm rereading sentences because I hardly have a hard time understanding them any longer. So, yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm just glad. I, I can't wait to read these books, but I am holding off. I, I have too much to do to get uh, hooked into a series. How many books well, are there? 20? Uh, there's 11. 11. And there's a 12th one coming. And, oh, they're just, it's so well done. The writing is spectacular, and the, the characterization, the, the development of the people. And he doesn't mind killing off important people. So it's like, ooh, I like that guy. Yeah. Well, he's mm, space sorry. dust now. Space so, dust. Uh, yep, yep. But, uh, oh, boy, it's, it's just, it's fantastic, uh, you know, space opera so mm -hmm. i wanted to remind people again Dave, david weber is the art is the artist is the author and the series is honor harrington the second book well, the first one was on basilic station the second one was um the honor of the queen 
So, yeah, I just, oh, wow. But, I, but for those of you who are waiting for the completion of Off the Grid, I am not reading any more of this. <laughs> I actually had someone tweet me, Steve, Stop. just put the Kindle down. We want Off the Grid finished no. so we can start using it. I know there's a ton of people waiting for me, so know that I am back on it. Um, I, had, I, did, I did lose two days cleaning up my office in order to have KABC come in and, and do their filming. Uh, that ended up being worthwhile. So I'm back to work now, and I'm going to get off the grid finished. Good so. for you. Okay. Um, we know that the – okay, I, I, for, I, I had a, a note to myself. Reality check number one. Okay. Some problems are hard and do not have good solutions. This is one of them. Another one, for example, is terrorism. You know, people don't want to acknowledge the, nat the nature, the fundamental nature of asymmetric warfare and that there just is not a, you, you, a way to defeat a tactic. You can't go to war against the tactic. And, and so, like terrorism, there, the problem of trust on the Internet is arguably an intractable problem. It, it doesn't have a good solution. There just isn't like some magic thing we haven't thought of yet. And you could probably, if you were a student of philosophical logic, you could probably assemble a proof that there, that there isn't a good solution. That you have to trust somebody and if you're going to do that, then they have to be perfect. And we understand that perfection is something which is inherently probably impossible for our solutions today to provide. So we're, we've had to settle for something less than perfect. Well, we've just seen a beautiful example of the way the certificate authority hierarchy fails us. And that is our browsers trust a... a unfortunately, a, a distressingly large array of, of certificate authorities, each of whom has the ability to sign any certificate for any server on the Internet. And because we trust the... In, we, we, have to, we, we have to trust in the perfect performance of every one of those certificate authorities... If any one of them screws up, then we're vulnerable to a certificate that they have signed, which we inherently trust. So a lot of bright people have said, okay, this is getting kind of creaky because now the number of certificate authorities is up to 600, and we're beginning to see cracks in this infrastructure. What can we do different? Now, the other problem that we've talked about in past podcasts and those of our listeners who haven't gone way back to number zero. I wish we did start with number zero. Leo, but <laughs> that would have been the right way. The right thing to right. do. What were number we one. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have talked, for example, about, you know, and I've grumbled about these things are not free either, these certificates that I'm buying from, I have been buying them from VeriSign. VeriSign never gets any more of my money. As we know, I'm switching over to DigiCert toward the end of the year. When the first one of my VeriSign certs expires, I'm going to move them all en masse over to DigiCert because they look really good. They're they they haven't made any mistakes, and uh, they're a lot less expensive for the certs that I want. I'll be able to switch up to the extended validation certs, and um, and they just look like a great company. So I'll be moving over. But there are many websites where arguably we don't require the authentication, which a real world process, an, off, an inherently offline process requires for someone's identity to be asserted, but we would like to have an SSL connection for, for privacy's sake, which is to say that, and I'm sure all of us, probably these listeners of 
a podcast like this more than the general public, but and I know you have, Leo, will we'll go to a site which is sort of off the main beaten path, but, you know, and, and maybe it's run by some Unix curmudgeon who refuses to pay anybody any money to have an SSL connection to his server. So what he does is he self-signs. Uh -huh. he, ha he has a certificate that he made himself, and he signed it himself. So he's just saying, I am me, darn it. Yeah. Take it or leave it. Right. Yeah. And that so gives you browser, SSL, right? It's just uh, that you can't verify identity. Precisely, because he signed it himself, and that, right. which is to say anybody could sign a certificate I've for their it. server. We've all done yep. it. Yep. I'm a self-signer. Self all, I have a server that, not surprisingly, is called Steve, and which is what I use for testing my stuff locally before I publish it up on, up on GRC. So I have www.steve and Steve, and I've got self-signed certificates that last 100 years, so I don't have to worry about them all the time. And so... So I've trained my browsers to stop bitching about them. You know, yes, I trust this strange person named Steve who see, apparently signed his certificate by himself, <laughs> for himself. And that way I'm able to establish my own local SSL connections to test the SSL paths of things I'm doing. So it's very useful for me. And so, so, so what happens is some people will go to a site and which is not, you know, a major site, which can arguably afford the, the, ex, the you know, every two-year expense of, of sign, having certificates re-authenticated re and signed by a trusted authority. Um, and they don't want to. They just say, they're, they're just saying, look, if you want an SSL connection, here's my certificate. I signed it myself, you know, take it. And whoever I am, you can have you can have privacy, but you don't get authenticity because I'm not willing to pay any money to a third party to tell me who I am. So okay, fine. But the problem is, um, we have a new acronym which I really love, and our listeners will too, which is called Tofu. T O F U. So first you have P, then Pi. We have P, now then tofu. we have Pi, now we have Tofu. Yes. Tofu stands for trust on first use, oh. which is inherently what we're doing. Right. We're going to somewhere where the site says, hey, I've got SSL, but I'm not having any third party vouch for me, so trust me. Now, theoretically, if at that instant somebody was was had had a man in the middle attack up against you, then you're accepting as that site whatever certificate they give you, and you're and you're not having it verified with a third party. So you are trusting what you get on first use, that is tofu, and you're you're telling your browser, yes, I know, it's okay. Trust this and don't bother me about it anymore. So that's a worthwhile model, which is to say, I mean, in, in general, it would be nice. We've talked about the, the overall problem that we're not using SSL all the time. It would be a much better Internet if we were. Yet, arguably, lots of servers don't feel the need and don't have, for whatever reason don't want to expend the cost of of maintaining certificates so as a consequence we don't have private connections to them we've got completely sniffable you know in any public wi-fi completely sniff or or in many land situations completely sniffable communications so um and, and then there are, there are other situations where for example we've got We've got multiple web domains hosted on the same IP, and that causes problems with SSL certificates because, because servers need to bind to an IP because you establish your connection before you, you, you exchange SSL um, data. And, and so it's difficult to, to disambiguate multiple domains on the same IP, although... That, that has been 
addressed in later versions of these protocols, which are not yet uh, prevalent. So, so we've got a number of problems. So it would be nice if there was, first of all, potentially a way of doing something better than our current certificate hierarchy, where we've got our certificate authority and we trust those guys to be absolutely perfect. And it would also be nice if we had something better than, maybe not perfect, but better than the tofu model, which allowed us, for example, imagine if, if it were possible to, to have sufficient trust in self-signed certificates so that users were not even bothered. If that were the case, then it would be much more likely that all websites or a much greater percentage could say, hey, you know, let's add self-signed certificates to our server because all the browsers now support this alternative model. So um, Moxie Marlin Spike, our old friend, has put together, he gave a Black Hat presentation about... Um, about a system which he has put together called Convergence. It's at the website convergence.io. And he currently has a Firefox add-on, which you can download and install, which essentially lifts you up off of the, the traditional CA, Certificate Authority, hierarchy into an entirely different model of of certificate verification, um, authenticity, which is, it's based on what I guess I would call a federated trust model. It's based on some, some work from about three years ago that was uh, done by uh, folks at Carnegie Mellon. And they even produced, these guys, the uh, CMU folks, produced a Firefox add-on called Perspectives. Their project was is at perspectives-project.org. And anybody who's curious can find a PDF. It's a 14-page PDF from the Usenix 08 conference where they presented this. Okay. Um, the idea is that you would change your browser or enhance your browser or browsers to, to trust a sort of a top level notary organizer. The, the idea is there, there's a, a network of geographically distributed notary servers, they call them, because the notaries, in, in, just as a, a real world notary witnesses you signing some document and then adds their own notarization to the document saying we witnessed this these these notaries are sort of independent probes of the SSL TLS certificate system the idea of them being geographically spread is you would like them to be widely distributed across the internet so that they have completely independent links into all of the different web servers that they're probing and diff completely different links into you. So the idea is this, this geographic spread gives us gives us network level robustness against man in the middle attacks where a bad guy is able to insert themselves somewhere in the network so if if immediately your traffic as you as as we the client probes these notaries if it heads off in different directions then any one link or set of routes that may be compromised still leaves out others that aren't. So, so this geographic spread is a good thing. And the same thing is true on the side of the notaries, which are checking in with the various servers. So the way this works is that 
our browser holds the the public key of one or more of these notary organizers the notary organizer is sort of the sort of the master coordinator of a group of notaries under its management so for example the EFF might be running a a perspectives set of notaries spread all over the globe and and our client that uses this system would come probably with their public key built in and maybe other organizations would run like well-known trusted organizations would also be running their own notary networks so the point is we somehow receive these these notary coordinator public keys out of band meaning you know not over the internet or not 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 through normal daily processes but probably bound into the you know sort of like built right into the clients in the same way that that right now we have certificate authorities whose public keys are bound into our browsers so again you always have to have some some beginning trust route that you work from so so the client asks the notary organizer for the list of notaries that it manages and it provides a a list by their IP address and their public key so note not their DNS name but their IP address so so this lifts us immediately away from a dependence on DNS so that requires that these notaries be at fixed IPs or at least that this list be updated if those IPs should change but they're not expected to change often so now we have a trusted signed list of notaries and we're talking about oh, you know maybe 20 um, that that are scattered around the globe our client maintains that is a browser or whatever utility we're using that, that wants to establish verifiable SSL connections maintains its own local cache of the public keys it has seen before now that's different than what we have today remember that today we are we're we as we make an SSL connection we receive the public key from the remote server and in the which is bound into a certificate which has been signed by someone we trust and on the on the spot we verify the timestamp that this certificate is not expired and also that it's that this certificate was signed by someone that we currently trust that happens every time we make a connection so you know and because it's all local it's very low weight it doesn't cost any time for us to do that right here so we add something so so this system starts by adding something different now we have the notion of a cache of certificates that we have seen before and that have already qualified themselves as trustworthy so in the typical case of like going back and reestablishing an SSL connection to Amazon or to you know MSN or to Facebook or 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 Google we will be we will be receiving public keys which are already in our cache and have already passed muster for and and we'll talk about what that process is next but so in general we're we're seeing oh yeah same key we've seen before trust it period and so off we go so there isn't a lot of overhead in the case of ever revisiting a site that we've seen before which has not changed its its certificate and also which is not currently suffering some sort of an attack so in the case that we encounter a new certificate we the client looks and says wait a minute never seen this one before let's let's see what the internet thinks let's essentially let's see what this our network of notaries thinks about it so 
we use a very lightweight protocol, which, and we've talked about UDP before. There's no three way handshake, send, SIN, SINAC, and ACK packets, and all that. It's much more lightweight in the same way that DNS is. We send, we, we randomly select maybe 10, for example, and, and in the, in their paper, they, they use a range 4 to 10. So a bunch of notaries from our trusted notary list, which we get from the sort of this, the central notary coordinator. And we, to those IPs, we immediately in parallel send out a, by you using a UDP protocol, so just a single packet, we send out a query for the um for the most well for the history and this is another important aspect for the history of certificates that those each of those geographically dispersed notary hosts has seen in the past they receive our single udp query and and if they know something about that machine they they respond they maintain a a cache and a history of of each domain's certificate past so if they have not yet encountered a if, if, if they don't already have some history then that that stimulates them to go query that domain and initiate a history for their response, which is, won't be much of a history, but at least it's something. And again, even that is significant because we've, we've asked the server over a direct path from us to the server and back for its certificate, and it gave us one. But in order to, even with no other history, in order to verify that through this system, we send out a call to the four corners using UDP saying, what does anybody know about this guy? So that goes out immediately in a whole bunch of different directions to servers, which will then make a query to that domain name if they haven't encountered it before from a whole bunch of different directions. So immediately we, we get away from the notion of a single, a single path being compromised. Now, in the typical case, though, of a high-use website like Amazon or Google or, or Facebook, whatever, there will be an existing history. The, these, these notary servers typically probe all of the domains that they are maintaining a list of several times a day. And as long as they see the same public key come back, as, as is the last one in their records, they simply update a time last seen timestamp. So this history of, of public keys, which they maintain, will, will have, it has a time first seen, timestamp of last seen, and what the public key is. So, so those geographically distributed notaries send all this informa information back in responding UDP packets. So very quickly, our client has from the four corners, it has a, a blob of data. Now, the last seen timestamp will probably be different on all of them, as will the first seen. But what happens is, if you can imagine that all of these notaries are independently probing this domain, poking at it a few times a day, asking for its public key, they're, they're ending up with a, a growing level of, of certainty over what this domain's public key is. So if the client receives the the records from all these different notaries, which all agree about what this, this domain's public key is, and if there's large overlapping agreement 
in how long this key has been valid, and it matches the key, which is pending for this for the conversation we're in the process of starting up. Remember, we only have to do all of this if we haven't ever contacted this site before so that we don't already have its public key in our cache or in the typically unlikely case of the key changing, which will happen, for example, every two years. So, so this allows us, without, without um, a single point of trust, which we have always had so far with, with the um, uh, CA-based technology, it allows us to establish a, a substantial level of trust, which, um, which is also inexpensive. Unlike the inherently um, sort of human overhead of, of verifying real-world identity, which is what I go through, for example, every couple of years with VeriSign, where they make me jump through some hoops. There's like telephone confirmation, and I've got to get Sue, you know, standing by GRC's phone line, and she, because that's the number that they've got, so she's got to be there to say, yes, this is me, and, and, and you know, there, there, there's a lot of lot, physical world hoops you jump through. That's never going to be inexpensive. Instead, this is a, so, so we, we would call that a way of binding the identity to the public key, this system is fully automated and establishes a sort of a, a geographically distributed and temporally distributed trust in the binding of a public key to a domain in a way that's automated, so it's, it's fundamentally less expensive. And what it means, for example, if, if you know, I, I would argue that this probably doesn't replace, you know, B of A's certificate being signed by VeriSign. You know, you still really maybe ultimately want authenticity um, and the only, or authentication. And the only way you can really get that is if, if you really trust VeriSign to, to never make a mistake and VeriSign is asserting this is really B of A. But you know, we've seen this break down. And what's, what's arguably superior about this distributed system is it doesn't have a single point of failure. A bad guy could, the, the, the compromised key would, would have some of these notaries not agreeing. A bad, if bad guys compromised one or two of these widely distributed notaries, then the notaries wouldn't agree. So we have redundancy among these notary servers we've got we have redundancy because we're not running all of our um, verification across a single link it immediately spreads out as it leaves us going to in different directions to widely geographically distributed notaries and their probings of the server comes into the server from their widely geographically distributed locations so we get a lot of redundancy a very lightweight UDP protocol, which we only need in the instance of, of having a non-expired certificate that we have never seen before um, and one that we don't already trust. So what, we're, what, the client, what the user's client also gets is something we've never had before. That is a, the notion of security policies. At the moment, we've either got yes or no. Either the browser trusts the certificate because it was signed by someone it trusts, that is in the existing model, or it doesn't. It's either good or bad. But now we have much more control over the nature of the way we want to trust. So, for example, in, in, the, um, in the clients, they're able to tell us what they have found out. And, and bring it to us in a, in a, in a sort of a user-friendly way. They could say, for example, the key you've just received from this domain that you're wanting to connect to has been seen consistently across the notary network for X days. And that could be, you know, 572. And so, you know, if that's what you're told, if you're told from 
this widely distributed network that this is the same key that they've all been seeing for 572 days. It's, you know, that's better really than anything that, that in terms of real reliability that the certificate authority system we have today is able to assert. It sounds like or, a good way to do it. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or it could say we have a suspected attack. The offered key is not consistent. Only X out of Y notaries currently see it. So that would raise some alarm. Or you could get a warning. The server key has only been consistently seen for the past X days. So, for example, maybe two. So, or the offered key conflicts with the cached key, but has been consistently seen for X number of days. Now, that's what you'd expect to see if somebody had had just updated a, an expiring key with a new one. You would have the old one in the cache, and 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 this would be changed. But the notary network that would you know have already been probed. It would be probing multiple times a day, and if and, and probably other people would have certainly driven that don't that target domain's current key into their new list you would be able to see oh your old key was in the list and it's been replaced by the new key so you you could note you could see that that there was an old key that that they all had which is what you still have in your cache but now everybody for the last 5 days has got this new key and that's what you've just be, you've just received. So it allows you to to basically track major changes and and really not fall prey to to the kind of a, attacks that that we are seeing before. So um, on Moxie's site, convergence.io, what he's basically done is implemented everything I've just said in a Firefox plugin. And under he's got a page of like like benefits, and I'm just going to run through them now that we've got an understanding of what this architecture is. I want to run through the things that that he's claiming, and and we'll just discuss it in that context. So he says his convergence.io system is secure. He says convergence is a secure replacement for the certificate authority system, rather than employing a traditionally hard-coded list of immutable CAs, Convergence allows you to configure a dynamic set of notaries which use network perspective to validate your communication. And that's exactly what we've just heard me describe. He says, trust agility. Convergence allows you to choose who you want to trust rather than having someone else's decision forced on you. You can revise your trust decisions at any time so that you're not locked in to trusting anyone for longer than you want. He says, distributed. Convergence makes it easy for anyone to run their own trust notary, which is a good point I, that I didn't bring up. Individuals can run their own if you chose, or your organization could run its own. If you were like a big company like IBM with offices spread all over the place, set up trust notaries, ma manage your own central, um, central organizer, and, and, then, you know, and then have your own IBM client browsers use this system as, as opposed to the centralized certificate authority system. So that's entirely possible within this same scenario. So he says, continuing on this, on this topic of trusting, of running your own trust notary, each notary can only make security decisions for the clients that have chosen to trust it. So the security, integrity, or accuracy of a notary does not affect those who have not selected it for trust. Robust. Convergence can be configured to require trust consensus amongst multiple notaries, preventing any single notary from having the ability to compromise security, which is another good point. Right now, we, we rely entirely on one single certificate authority operation to, 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 to sign a, a certificate. Here, we're inherently 
not relying even on a single notary because if we send out probes to 10 and a couple of them have been compromised or a couple of the links to or from them have been compromised, they won't agree with the rest. So we can we, we can go, okay, something's a little flaky here, but you know the majority of them agree, so it looks like this is good to go. Or we could be, you know, really super cautious and say, ah, we're going to decide we don't want to do any trusting right now until we figure out what this means. And he says, simple. Convergence is fully backward compatible with the existing deployment of certificates and does not require website operators to change anything. Oh, I forgot one point, and that is that if a site wanted to make sure it's, it's convergence friendly or perspectives friendly all for example said that i wanted to make sure that i was listed all i would have to do as as a site owner would be to send a request to these various notaries if they didn't already have me in their list they would they would treat me like a client and so they would they would request grc's public key on my own behalf and so that's a way i have of of making sure that they're able to respond to queries about me quickly so that's a, a another sort of a cool thing and he says just as just install the firefox add-on select whom you trust and be done with certificate authorities forever everything will look exactly the same and you'll never get a self-signed certificate warning again which is one of the very cool things which is you know, if uh, as we were saying at the top of this topic, going to a site which has a self-signed certificate has had the downside that people would get warnings. And I'm sure m many people go, I don't know what that means. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to click away from this. Now, this system beautifully solves the self-signed certificate problem in a way that, that doesn't cause any trouble. So I wouldn't, you know, while this could be used as a replacement for the certificate authority system. I see this as really nicely augmentative um, and potentially allows lots of sites that have not before now been able to, to, to justify the, the loss in traffic of, of a self-signed certificate to say, yeah, this is not going to raise alarms and now we're going to be able to give people privacy and at zero cost. Ah, and he also says anonymous. Convergence caches trust information locally and has a mode to shield your IP address from notaries when communicating with them so that you never leak your browsing history to anyone else. Now, that is a downside of, of this system, which um, is, is worth mentioning. And that is that if we don't have a domain in our cache, we are asking a third party for verification of that site's specific public key, which means, oh, and we're sending UDP packets, which means the notary can, if it wished to, monitor where we're going. Now, that's, that is a, I mean, that's, like I said, there aren't any free lunches here. The beauty of the existing system is that it is fully anonymous. We trust certificate authorities. There's no traffic with our brow from, from our browsers when we go to a site we've never seen before because it will be signed by someone we trust. Therefore, we trust the certificate implicitly. Well, we don't have that. If we use this notary-based system, we are leaking out to this network of notaries where we're going. Now, I don't know how Moxie has, has have gotten around that. Maybe, um, well, I, I just don't know. I, it's hard for me to imagine, and I haven't looked into it. But it is worth noting that, that in this case, in the case of at least the perspective systems, we are leaking our browsing history. So that's reason, for example, to use a network like the EFF, where we, you know, we, it's really clear that these guys are on the side of, of privacy and, and on, on our side. 
so that and so that you know they're not logging and not tracking us and doing anything else nefarious with this information. But that is a downside of of this um, um, an active traffic based approach. At the same time, we we uh, we were talking about revocation the other day and the the OCSP problem, the Online Certificate Status Protocol, has the same problem. That is for our browser. To be told to check for a certificate being revoked means that we're sending that off to a third-party server to ask if the certificate is still okay, and it's able to see who who we are by our IP address and also what site we're asking it about. So you know, the, again, some of these problems do not have really good solutions. Um, and he says it's fast. Convergence is so lightweight, you won't even know it's there and proven. And he says, Convergence is based on the ideas originally developed by the Perspectives Project at Carnegie Mellon University. So that is the, you know, arguably the, the alternative architecture that has, I think, a very good chance of gaining traction. We've got a, a plug-in now for Firefox. If this begins to gain traction... I could see other browsers supporting it at least as an option, as a lightweight solution for, for um, uh, maybe not existing signed certificates, but certainly certificates that are self-signed. If, if we want to say, okay, uh, I really don't want to see these as long as a bunch of notaries whom I trust are all saying, yep, this is the one we've seen this site providing. Uh, this is probably really theirs. So it's a neat system, and it by by getting around the the need for real world verification of identity by binding it through um, a, an automated system rather than a, a physical system, um, we end up being able to do it at no cost and very little overhead. So that's the alternative, and uh, no one's come up with anything better. I like it. And thank yep. you, Mar Moxie Marlin Spike, not his real name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for the plugin um, and the idea. Do you, th you think yeah. there's a okay? Let's be honest. Is there a chance in hell this will happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> we have such an entrenched system. Although the notary edition doesn't seem like such a big deal. Yes, and and I mean, if we okay, so there's really no way to bring up ubiquitous SSL, except to solve the problem of self-signed certificates right. and annoying users. This really does that. Right. This is, you know, this really for, if, you know, if all the browsers had this system and if they did, then any, and of course we would then add nice, simple to use utilities that all web webmasters could use to generate self-signed certificates, then this would be really cool. And in fact, you could imagine something nice where, um, uh, where a header in non-SSL communications could mention that in, in the same way that we have a do not track header, it, there, there could be a header saying, I support a self-signed cert, then that would tell your browser, oh, let's bounce back to this guy over SSL rather than uh, over not, knowing that we've got a self-signed cert and that would allow us to have privacy. So you could see that it could be implemented in a, in a safe and clean fashion um, that would, would allow people to, um, uh, to switch over to privacy by default rather than no privacy by default, which would certainly be an improvement for the Internet. This, that, I could easily allow this, um, I, I could easily imagine this system doing. It's the kind of thing that, um, I don't, I'm just trying to think of who would, who could use, who could strong arm this kind of system. But is it ICANN that could kind of push this kind of system in? Who, who well, is, actually, ICANN is, ex, or I, the IETF. IETF, is that's doing, who could do it. Yeah, they're, they are looking at a... Well, they're they're looking at a DNS sec based approach, right. where where secure DNS would be used to to independently offer certificates instead of the certificate authority. So the idea would be we would use we would use the next generation signed DNS records 
in order to to say okay this is a way of we now we're getting the IP address in a way that we absolutely can trust and we're getting the domains public key similarly in a way that we absolutely can trust not with a certificate authority so that so that that's the direction the IETF is approaching or, or pursuing and the problem is we're still a long way away from DNSSEC being ubiquitously uh, deployed yeah but you know that could happen too Steve you you hope springs eternal <laughs> in the secure mind and so does honor and honor Yes, Honor Black. What is your name, last name? Honor Harrington. Harrington. She didn't get killed. You couldn't kill her. Oh, no. She She's got, the star of our show. She got some serious commendations. <laughs> I can't wait. Oh, Leo, you you'll see be Steve up. wanting to go back. Oh, uh, I can't wait. I, I, I desperately do. I'm going to be in such good shape because I'm just going to have to be on the stair climber in order, in order to read, start into book three. But brilliant. I'm going to get off the grid finished first. That's a brilliant uh, way to do it. See, I'm only yeah. going to do this when I'm exercising. Exactly. Steve is at grc.com. That's his website. That's where you'll find Spinrite, his bread and butter, and uh, the world's finest hard drive maintenance uh, utility. He also uh, has a lot of great stuff there that, for free, including off the grid and uh, and uh, Almost. The, hey, password haystacks. Well, you got the off the grid concept there. Uh, the concept's in place. I just got to get it nailed down so people can actually use it. Right. And I'm really in, I'm really pleased that so many people are like panting. It's like, hey, I want to use this thing. So I was like, <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, St Steve get, gets a lot of thrill out of this. He's definitely an enthusiast, and that's what makes it so Why good. I do it. Yep. Uh, you'll find uh, also 64 and 16 kilobit versions of the audio of this show there, as well as transcripts uh, at the Security Now page on grc.com. We have... Uh, audio and video uh, on our page at twit.tv. And, of course, you can watch us do this show Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or twit.tv. So uh, you can watch live or get it after the fact. A lot of times people watch live and then get the show and listen again, then get the transcript and read that. And by the third or fourth time through, they understand oh it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's only 319 of them to do that with. I, I I was talking to somebody who said professor uh, uses it a lot. I think a lot of college professors use it in uh, in computer science classes and security classes. Yes, we have heard a lot of feedback yeah. from people say, "Hey, this is you know this is a, this has been assigned to me in my in my class." So, I also wanted to thank the folks at New Tech. They are the ones who make our uh, video toaster. Actually, it's called the TriCaster that lets us switch cameras like this, add lower thirds. It gives us so much capability. We're just a big fan of it. In fact, it really powers the entire uh, Twit Brick House Studios. It's all based on TriCaster, baby. And if you are ever in the need of a video production facility, a, basically a video truck in a box, go to NewTek, N-E-W-T-E-K dot com, and take a look at the TriCasters. The TriCaster 850 Extreme is what we use. And I almost hate to say that because we're, we're using like 5%. It's like your brain. We're using 5% of its capabilities. And, uh, you know, as time goes by, we're going to use a lot more of it. But uh, we just love it. We have, the, we have the capability to do so much with this TriCaster. And we just encourage you all to take a look. New tech, N -E -W -T -E -K com. Steve, that concludes this edition of Security Now. It does. Next week, we'll do a Q&A. So anybody who's got any questions raised by this, I imagine there will be some. Uh, by all means, grc.com slash feedback. Uh, drop your note to me there, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll see him, and we'll address him next week. Excellent. We'll see you next time on Security Now. Security Now.